Amen. Amen. Our Father, we thank you for Tuesday meeting. Thank you for this development session. We're asking, Lord, that you speak to everyone, even today, in Jesus' name. Amen. Open our eyes of understanding. Amen. Help us to see the truth of your word in Jesus' name. Amen. We're asking, Lord, that you'll keep us awake. Amen. You apply the word to every heart. Amen. Our lives will never be the same again in Jesus' Amen. name. Amen. And our ministries, too, will move forward. There will be real passion. There will be understanding. There will be courage. There will be conviction. And this work will prosper in our hands in Jesus' name. Bless us so we can be a blessing to the people. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you very much. We can sit down. We're reading from Romans chapter 15, and I'm reading from verse 4. Romans chapter 15, verse 4. For whatsoever things were reaching aforetime, were reaching for our learning, that we, through patience and comfort of the scriptures, might have hope. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, from verse 11, now, all these things happened unto them. For example, and they are reaching for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the world are come. It's telling us about the records of the writings in the Old Testament. That those things were reaching, not just to make history, and not just to make the Bible voluminous, but they are reaching for our learning. And then he calls us to what we ought to do in First Timothy chapter 4, reading from verse 15. First Timothy chapter 4, verse 15. Meditate upon these things. Give thyself wholly to them that thy profiting may appear to all. I want to welcome everyone again to a dynamic session of Christian leaders training and development. But I need to point out something for you and for myself, that the calling and the ministry of a Christian leader, the calling and the ministry of a Christian teacher, of a minister in the gospel, of a youth leader, of a pastor over young adults, the ministry of a mother in the Lord, the ministry of any one of us here gathered, is not just for ourselves. We're not learning any subject just for ourselves that is immediately relevant to us. What does that mean? A teacher, for example, that goes to school to teach, goes to learn. And what he learns is not something necessarily of immediate relevance to him. But his learning for the students is going to teach. Not only that, think about an engineer, for example. An engineer does not learn just for his personal needs, but he learns it as broad, it learns something as broad as the society will need. And so as you come here, whatever we're learning here is not just because of you. And it is not that, you know, we read this passage directly because either you had fault on this or you had fault on that. No, not at all. It is because the congregation we teach will need all these things and we need to have real understanding of the word of God. Take a doctor for example. A doctor does not limit his knowledge to the diseases that he might be susceptible to. He learns for a wide range of patients. He knows that I'm going to meet this, I'm going to meet this, I'm going to meet that. And he learns for them. And it's not just for himself. The pastor, the preacher, the leader, the teacher does not learn only for himself. 
He learns for a wide range of people. He's going to help saints and sinners. He learns for them. He's going to counsel believers and unbelievers, and therefore he learns for them. He's going to meet the strong and the weak, the wise and the simple. He's going to have the tried and the tempted in his congregation. He's going to have people who are fervent. He's going to have people who are lukewarm. And because of that, what he learns is for them. If he just says that subject does not concern me because that's not my problem, yes, it may not be your problem, but you're learning for your congregation. We must be able to teach, able to help, able to counsel, able to encourage, able to warn, be able to assist, be able to inspire, be able to strengthen the inner Joseph's in our congregation facing temptation. We must be able to help some saints who are very strong but they're weak in a particular area. We must be able to help people like Saul in our congregation or Solomon's in our congregation. There might be Daniel's in your congregation that needs to make a firm commitment. And you need to know to help that Daniel to be firm. There may be Abigail's in your congregation. There may be Ruth's in your congregation. The brass in your congregation. And what you're learning is to be able to have something that will help every one of them. There are families in your congregation. And those families will need the teaching, the warning, all the things that we may learn here. That's the reason we're learning. And so as we come with a subject like this tonight, what we're going to talk about is not like, ah, does the pastor think, you know, we're so bad? No, not at all. Even if you were as perfect as an angel, your congregation may not be as perfect like that. Everyone in the congregation will not be at that same level. Because of that, we need teaching. And we need counseling that will help us to be able to help everyone. And I pray that God will give us wisdom in Jesus' name. For example, teaching and warning about cancer. A doctor comes and he teaches us and he holds a seminar or a conference about cancer. That does not mean that the whole congregation is having cancer. It's to prepare us. In fact, we're told right now that prevention is better than cure. And when you teach people like that, even if they don't have those problems, and you're warning them ahead of time, that's the reason why we come together tonight and we're looking at the subject we're looking at even if you were perfect, as perfect as an angel, I pray you'll pay attention. And this word will enrich every one of our lives in Jesus' name. I'm coming to 1 Kings chapter 11. In 1 Kings chapter 11, I'm reading from verse 1. It says, but King Solomon lodged many strange women together with the daughter of Pharaoh. It says, women of the Moabites the Ammonites, the Edomites, and the Zidonians, and the Hittites, of the nations concerning which the Lord had said unto the children of Israel, Ye shall not go in to them, neither shall they come in unto you. For surely they will turn away your heart after their God Solomon cleave unto these in law. And he had seven hundred wives and princesses, and three hundred uh, concubines, and his wife turned away his heart. For it came to pass, when Solomon was old, that his wives turned away his heart after other gods. And his heart was not perfect, for the Lord is God, as was the heart of David his father. For Solomon went after Ashtaroth, the goddess of the Zidonians, and after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites, and Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord, and went not fully after the Lord, as did David his father. Then did Solomon build a high place for Chemosh, the abomination of Moab, in the hill that is before Jerusalem. And for Molech, the abomination of the children of Ammon. And likewise did he for all his strange wives. How many of them? He did it for all of them. 
which burnt incense and sacrifice unto their gods. And the Lord was, tell me, angry was Solomon. And the Lord was angry, angry, angry was Solomon because his heart was turned from the Lord God of Israel, which had appeared unto him twice. Tonight we're looking at the message, we're considering the message, the minister's preservation for an enduring ministry. The minister's preservation for an enduring ministry. There are three points we're looking at. Number one, the avoidable provocation of divine anger and self-destruction. Avoidable provocation. Solomon didn't need to have done all those things that he did. He could have avoided all those things. And so the provocation of God to anger in any of our lives is not necessary. We don't have to do those things. We don't have to provoke the Lord. We don't have to provoke the anger of the Lord. Avoidable provocation of divine anger and eventually the self-destruction. Let's look at First King again. We're reading from chapter 11 verse 9. First Kings chapter 11 verse 9. It says, And the Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart was turned from the Lord God of Israel that had spoken to him twice. What did he do? Already we read from verse 1 all through to verse 9. He married all these many wives. And as we look at the word of God, the word of God had warned, had warned all the Israelites generally. And I'd want anyone that will become a king over the land of Israel, over the people of Israel. And I told them this is exactly what they will not do. We're looking at uh, Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 17. Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 17. It says, neither shall he multiply wives to himself. It's talking about the king. That his heart turn not away, neither shall he greatly multiply to himself silver and gold. If God gave the silver, if God gave the gold, it will be for, the, for Israel, it will be for the nation, it will be to build the temple, it will be to do the work of God. He will not multiply to himself the silver and the gold. He will not multiply to himself wives. That is exactly what he did. Not only that, look at Deuteronomy chapter 7. And we're reading from verse 2. Deuteronomy chapter 7. We're reading here from verse 2. Here it says, it says from verse 2, And when the Lord thy God shall deliver them before thee, thou shalt smite them, and utterly destroy them. Thou shalt make no covenant with them, nor show mercy unto them. Look at verse 3. Neither shalt thou make marriages with them. Thy daughter thou shalt not give unto his son, nor his daughter shalt thou take unto thy son. For they will turn away thy son from following me. The Lord was very clear. When you get to that land, you will not take their daughters. You will not give your daughter. And you will not take their daughter for your son. It says so. Will the anger of the Lord be kindled against you and destroy you suddenly? You see, it wasn't necessary for Solomon to have done that. He knew the word of God. He should have known the word of God. But we need to remind ourselves, that's not the only thing that provokes the anger of God. Yes, that polygamy, 
provoked the anger of God. Yes, marrying from those Gentile nations provoked the anger of God. There are some other things too that provoke the anger of God. And we need to learn this so that we can avoid them. And then as we are teaching other people, we know that in their lives, these are the things that will provoke the anger of God. And we help them, we teach them, we want them, we counsel them, we instruct them so that the anger of God will not come upon their lives. Deuteronomy chapter 9. We're reading from verse 16. Deuteronomy chapter 9. Reading from verse 16. And I looked... And behold, ye had sinned against the Lord your God, and had made you a molten calf. Ye had turned aside quickly out of the way which the Lord had commanded you. And I took the two tables and cast them out of my two hands and break them before your eyes. And I fell down before the Lord as at the first forty days and forty nights I, I did neither eat bread nor drink water because of all your all your sins which he said in doing wickedly in the sight of the Lord tell me what follows now to provoke him to anger the children of Israel came out of the land of Egypt. And now because Moses had gone to the Lord to collect the tables of the law, before he came back, they had made idols and were following. These be thy gods that brought you out of the land of Egypt. And it says that provoked him to anger. Look at verse 20. And the Lord was very angry with who? with Aaron to have destroyed him but and I prayed for Aaron also the same time why was God angry with Aaron because Aaron was the leader at home when Moses went to the mountain top and the people came and said oh make us gods that will follow because as for Moses we don't know what has happened to him and he was so weak weak spied weak in backbone weak in conviction and weak in courage and weak in conviction that you couldn't say no that cannot be that's idol worship and we are not going to worship idol and when moses came back and he said aaron what have you done he said you know these people they are set on mischief they are ready to stone me and i cannot take their opposition i can't take their criticism that's why i did that for them Whenever we yield to the congregation, whenever any leader, any pastor, any teacher, any counselor, whenever any person yields to the congregation because that's what they want, and yet we are learning the standard, it makes God angry against us. And we don't have to provoke that anger. We don't have to do that. We can take our stand. We can read the word of God to them and say, here is the way, walk ye therein. Let's look at uh, Numbers chapter 12. The things that provoke God's anger. Avoidable, avoidable. We don't have to do them. Numbers chapter 12. I'm reading from verse 1. And Miriam and Aaron spake against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman whom he had married. For he had married an Ethiopian woman. Here is something avoidable. We don't have to do this. Now, uh, Moses did not just marry this uh, woman. This uh, woman he married when he ran away. And then he was with Jethro. And already he brought the woman back, he knew that. And all this time, he performed those miracles before Pharaoh. Nobody spoke about any woman. And then he brought them through the Red Sea. Nobody spoke about any woman. But when envy and jealousy came in, and they wanted to find something to talk about, after all, after all, is it only Moses God is talking to? Doesn't he talk to us too? After all, he married, uh, you know, an Ethiopian woman. And look at this. We're looking at uh, verse 2. And they said, as the Lord indeed spoke in, only by Moses, as see not spoken also by us, and the Lord heard it. All the murmuring, 
all the gossiping, unnecessary conversation. What was the result of that? We're looking at verse 9. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against them, against Aaron and against Miriam. And he departed, and the cloud departed from off the tabernacle. And behold, Miriam became leprous, white as snow. And Aaron looked upon Miriam, and behold, she was leprous. That wasn't necessary. He shouldn't have done that. It's, unavo it's an avoidable provocation of anger from the Lord. And it brings judgment. It brought disease upon her. We're looking at Numbers chapter 22. Numbers chapter 22. We're reading from verse 22. And God's anger was kindled because he went. This is talking about Balaam. Balak said people to Balaam and said come and cause these people for me and Balaam said please hold on I have to pray I have to check off from God I cannot go beyond the will the might of God he went to pray before he even prayed before his knees knocked the ground God said Balaam who are those with you and then he said the Balak sent them that I will come and curse some people that were passing through his land and God said don't you go because those are my children, my people. You will not curse them because they are blessed. He said, all right. Then he told those people, I cannot go because God told me that I must not go. And Balak sent back again and said, what's the matter with you? I'll promote you to great honor. I'll give you riches. I'll give you everything you want. He said, okay, let me go and ask God again. And when he went to ask God again, what did God say? What did God say? He said, go. You want to go? Go. People don't understand. They only look at the spelling G-O. Go. They don't look at the tone with which it was said. You want to go? Go. And he said, praise the Lord. No, don't praise the Lord. God is angry. He has permitted me. No, he has not permitted you. It's because he wanted to do your will. And because he went to look at this. And God's anger was kindled because he went. And the angel of the Lord stood in the way. For an adversary against him. Now he was riding upon his ass. And his two servants were with him. And the ass saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way. And his sword drawn in his hand. And the ass turned aside out of the way and went into the field. And Balaam smote the ass and turned her into the way. But the angel of the Lord stood in a path of the vineyards. A wall being on this side and a wall on that side. And when the ass saw the angel of the Lord, he thrust her herself onto the wall and crushed the Balaam's foot against the wall. And he smote her again. And the angel of the Lord went further and stood in a narrow place where was no way to turn either to the right hand or to the left. And when the ass saw the angel of the Lord, she fell down under Balaam. And Balaam's anger was kindled, and he smote the ass for the staff. And the Lord opened the mouth of the ass, and she said unto Balaam, What have I done unto thee? That thou hast meeting me these three times. And Balaam said unto the ass, Because thou hast mocked me, I would uh, there, I would, uh, I, I would be a wise sword in mine hand, for now would I kill thee. And the ass said unto Balaam, Am not I thine ass, upon which thou hast ridden ever since I was thine own until this day? Was I ever wont to do so unto thee? And he said, Nay. Then the Lord opened the eyes of Balaam. And he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way. And what? And his sword drawn in his hand. And he bowed down his head and fell flat 
on his face. And the angel of the Lord said unto him, Wherefore, as thou smitten then as these three times, behold, I went out to withstand thee, because thy way is perverse before me and they asked saw me and turned from me these three times unless she had turned from me surely now also i had slain thee and saved her alive and balaam said unto the angel of the lord i have seen i have seen i have seen for i knew not that thou stoodest in the way against me now therefore if it displeased thee you see that? Did it displease the Lord? He said, if, if it displeased thee, I will get me back again. Things that provoke God to anger. When God has said, that's not the way. He said it in his word. He said it through the pastor. He said it through the preaching. He said it through the counselors. He said it through the marriage committee. He said it through everybody. That is not the way. And yet we go to ask God again. Okay, I'm going to pray and fast. And let people come and join me and pray and fast. And God said that's not the way. And yet we still want to pursue that way. It provokes the anger of God. And it's not necessary. It's avoidable. Balaam shouldn't have done this. It was avoidable. We're looking at 2 Samuel chapter 6. The things that provoke God to anger that we can avoid, that we should avoid, so that his anger will not be upon our lives. 2 Samuel chapter 6. I'm reading from verse 6. And when they came to Nicholas threshold, Usa put forth his sand to the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen shook it. What happened here is that they wanted to bring the ark of the Lord to the right place. But then they didn't do it the way God has ordained, as expressly or commanded in the word of God. He had told them how to carry the ark, but now they went their own way. They were more intelligent than the reaching world. And as the oxen was carrying that ark, it shook. And because it shook, Uzzah felt I have a good intention. If you have a good intention, you disobey the word of God. It still makes God angry. I have a good a purpose. If you have a good purpose, and yet you are disobeying the word of God, God is still angry at you. And so he put forth his hand. Look at verse 7. What do you see in verse 7? Somebody tell me. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and God smote him there for his error, and there he died by the ark of God. You see, good intention is not, uh, it's not the answer, it's not the solution. I have a good motive, I have a good intention. What does the Bible say? What does the word say? We go back to the word and read the word and follow the commandments of the Lord, but you'll just say, I have a good intention, and because of my good intention, I know my goal, I know my heart, I know why I'm doing what I'm doing, and yet it's against the word of God. It provokes God to anger. Second, Second Chronicles, I'm reading from chapter 25. Second Chronicles, reading from chapter 25. And this is talking about a man. It's introduced to us in verses 1 and 2. And Amaziah was 25 years old when he began to reign. And he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Jehoadan of Jerusalem. Look at this in verse 2. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, but not with a perfect heart. He did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, but not with a perfect heart. There are people who get saved and they will not move on to sanctification. There are people who are righteous, outwardly righteous, everything appears okay, but then they will not go deeper in the Lord and get the Adamic nature removed. He did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, but not with a perfect heart. Look at what happened now, verse 14. Now it came to pass. After that, Amaziah was come from the slaughter of the Edomites, that he brought the gods of the children of Seir and set them up to be his gods. 
and he bowed down himself before them and burnt incense unto them wherefore the anger of the Lord was kindled against Amaziah you see that he went to battle and God gave him victory over the Edomites and then the gods of those people he took and he brought to his place and he bowed down himself unto them and it says wherefore because of that the anger of the Lord was kindled against Amaziah and he said and God said unto him a prophet which said unto him why as thou sought after the gods of the people which could not deliver their own people out of thine hand and it came to pass as he talked with him the king said unto him unto the prophet art thou made of the king's counsel forbear why shouldest thou be smitten he says don't counsel me don't talk to me don't correct me are you my counselor why are you talking to me like that I've done what I want to do. I am the king. And then the prophet forbear and said, I know that God has determined to destroy thee because thou hast done this and hast not hearkened unto my counsel. It wasn't necessary. He shouldn't have done that. He didn't need to do that. He already won the victory over those Edomites. These are avoidable provocations of God's anger. I pray that God will help us. I say God will help us. We will not be provoking God to anger in Jesus' name. We're looking at Job chapter 9. Job chapter 9. We're reading from verse 13. Job chapter 9. Read him from verse 13. If God will not withdraw his anger, the proud helpers do stoop under him. If God says, that's wrong, no matter how fast for you, no matter how praise for you, no matter who tries to help you, no matter who tries to get you out of that judgment of God, it says it will be in vain when we provoke the Lord to anger. Job chapter 21. Reading from verse 17, Job 21, reading from verse 17, How oft is the candle of the wicked put out? How oft cometh the destruction upon them? God distributeth sorrows, suffering, heartache, judgment in his anger. They are as trouble before the wind. And as chaff that the storm carrieth away. Psalm 7 verse 11. Psalm 7 verse 11. We're going to read this together. Psalm 7 verse 11. Are you ready? One, two, three, go. Can we read that again? For the final time, that's his nature. That's his nature. He doesn't want wickedness. That's his nature. He doesn't want unrighteousness. That's his nature. He doesn't want anything that contradicts his word. Anybody that comes and then with impunity will say, I know that's what God has said. I know that's what God wants. I know that's what the Bible says. But I'm going to go my own way because I'm Solomon and because I'm something and because I am so and so and because I'm wise and because I'm strong and because I'm mighty and because I'm the leader and because I'm the overall person. I'm the number one in the whole nation no matter who it says God judges the righteous and God is angry with the wicked how often every day God expresses love to Solomon but he sponge God's love and he sinned grievously against the Lord and God was angry at his sin and God's anger actually brought judgment upon him. And it's not only that. God is no respecter of persons. If anybody provokes the anger of God, God is angry with the wicked every day. What are we going to do so that we can be free from the anger?
beggar of the Lord, repentance, repentance, total repentance and thorough repentance. We'll come to point number two, the abominable practice of diverse atrocities and sure damnation. The abominable practice and diverse atrocities with sure damnation. As we look at uh, this story again, we're coming back to First Kings. We're coming to First Kings chapter 11. As we look at First Kings chapter 11, we'll see the deliberate action of Solomon, which was an abomination. It was an affront against the word of God, against what the Lord had said. But then he went ahead and did that. Look at uh, 1 Kings chapter 11 verse 1. But King Solomon loved many women. And then it goes on to say many strange women together with the daughter of Pharaoh. Look at the beginning of that. Daughter of Pharaoh. That is going back to Egypt. It says women of the Moabites and the Ammonites and the Edomites and the Zidonians and the Hittites of the nations concerning which the Lord had said unto the children of Israel, ye shall not. The Lord was clear. The word of God was clear. Ye shall not go in to them, neither shall they come in unto you. For surely, here is the word of God, surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. Solomon clave unto these in love. Look at verse 3. And he had 700, wa 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines, and his wives turned away his heart. Just like God had said, like the word of God had said, whatever wisdom you have, you'll not be wiser than the word of God. Because the word of God is the wisdom of God. And whatever wisdom any man has, he cannot be wiser than the almighty God. God had said, they will turn your heart away from me. And that's exactly what he did. For it came to pass in verse 4, when Solomon was old, that his wives turned away his heart after all the gods, and his heart was not perfect in with the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. Look at verse 9. And the Lord was, tell me out aloud, the Lord was angry with, with who? But he loved him before. If God had loved anybody, can, can he still be angry with that person? Of course, yes. Of course, yes. He was born again. I'm not talking about Solomon now. I'm saying somebody was born again and God loved him. And now he turns back into sin. God's anger is upon him. Somebody got uh, sanctified and laid everything upon the altar. And now he goes back into idol worship. He goes back into disobedience against the word of God. The anger of God comes against him. Somebody had been very useful. He's built uh, this uh, wonderful temple. And if he goes back and is not serving God again, and God is angry. And somebody had prayed. And somebody has uh, brought the glory she can of God uh, down because uh, you know after he prayed and all the musicians and they played all their instruments the glory of God came down what a great love and when he prayed and God said yes I've had your prayer I've chosen this place and my favor is upon this place and yet that person turning against God and fighting against the word of God the anger of God now comes upon him God has no favorites he loves you while you love him. He loves you while you are serving him. He loves you while you are following the word of God. He loves us while we are obeying the word of God. But if we turn, if we turn and then go into evil, go into polygamy and go into adultery and go into fornication and go to all these other things it says the anger of God will be upon us I pray the anger of God will not come upon us that means we are praying that we will not backslide we will not do evil and we are not going to provoke the anger of the Lord in Jesus name now I'm going to read some references of scripture, but before I read those references of scripture, let me tell you once again, preventive medicine has become a major practice for doctors. 
what that means is the doctors are not waiting until we contract some deadly incurable disease before attending to us now even our parents make serious efforts to protect us from moral abominations listen to this that they had fallen into you see god has made us pastors he's made us leaders he's made us fathers in israel and mothers in israel you see the point is this even if a father had done something wrong before and he suffered for it but now he has repented he doesn't want that same suffering to come upon his own children therefore he will warn his children the same thing a mother a mother might have you know done something wrong and now she has repented and she knows knows the Lord there's no condemnation for her but then she's still going to warn her daughters that this should not happen unto you our leaders our teachers our pastors still have to warn their congregations of damning sins even if they were guilty in the past please look up here you know sometimes a pastor might have done something wrong it's committed sin he was disciplined not just disciplined because of another person that sin, but because he himself committed sin but now he has been forgiven and when he is forgiven he comes back to the ministry somebody in the congregation might do the same thing that he did before and now he will say do i have any mouth to talk of course yes if you have been forgiven of course yes if you are now free of course yes because god is no more reckoning that sin against you anymore and he has brought you to be a leader and you cannot say i'm weak i cannot correct them you still have to think about a doctor who was sick for a particular disease and now he's totally healed and patients come to him he cannot say well i will not treat this one i will not be able to confidently minister minister treatment to this because of what I had before no right you're still a doctor if you're a doctor you're still going to attend to that individual a person who fell into a ditch before and then he was rescued he will continue to warn others of falling in and perishing let's say for example a prodigal son who had been restored into fellowship in the father's house because he's restored is free it's no more a prodigal son. Am I right? Yes. And because he has been forgiven and restored, it's righteous. And because he's righteous, he's come back home. It's no more in the far country. It's guiltless. If he happens to become a leader, if he happens to become a pastor, he must preach. I must preach the word of God. I said he must preach the word of God. He must warn. He must counsel. He must correct. He must teach. He must reprove boldly and firmly, unashamedly, faithfully, without reference to his forgiven past. That's important. You are not you are, you are counseling people. You are not going to say, well, actually, I'm counseling you, but, you know, I also did this before. No, doctors don't tell me that. Doctors don't tell us that you have a particular problem and the doctor is going to treat you and the doctor is not going to say well well before i even treat you you know even i myself about uh, one year ago i was down and then you are wondering can this one treat me no the doctors forget that because already they are well already they are all right and now they treat you the same thing if you had done something wrong before god has forgiven you and now you are totally free you will preach boldly and you'll preach assuredly and you're not going to you know minimize what you have to do if you have to discipline somebody because it's incorrigible you will not say can i discipline because look at what i was before that's forgotten that's forgiven that's not there anymore and because you're free here you are you are right with god today and you need to help this person to come out of that thing you are going to do it and you're going to do it effectively in jesus name and so if you're a pastor you'll preach you'll warn you'll counsel you'll correct you'll teach you'll reprove and you do that boldly and firmly unashamedly you're going to do that without referring to your past and you administer to the people everything they ought to have with courage with understanding now with that let's look at what the lord is telling us already we've read this but we're going to read it again deuteronomy chapter 7 deuteronomy chapter 7 here is what the lord has commanded here is the word 
word that we must teach to the congregation and your own children if they are not married yet they must know this one and uh, your own uh, you know converts if they are not married yet they must know this one here is the word of God and we cannot back out of this this is what ruined Solomon it will not ruin you it will not ruin your children it will not ruin your converts it will not ruin our church let's look at this it tells us in Deuteronomy chapter 7 verse 3 it says neither shall thou make marriages with them neither shall thou make marriages with them thy daughter thou shalt not give unto his son look up here for a moment giving your daughter out in marriage is your responsibility it's not the responsibility of a marriage committee. Marriage committee can counsel, marriage committee can advise, marriage committee can help, they can pray, they can do whatever. But giving your daughter out in marriage is your own responsibility. If you say, well, I'm helpless, my hands are down, what can I do? That is what they want. You're responsible. And if you give your daughter to somebody who is not the will of God, God is going to hold you responsible. Look at verse 3. Neither shall thou make marriages of them, thy daughter, thou shalt not give unto his son, nor his daughter shalt thou take unto thy son. It's a responsibility. If you say, well, this is my condition, look at what I'm, I'm doing now. My son says, this is the lady he must have. If that lady is not a believer, if that lady is not approved by you, if you don't have a green light, go ahead in your heart. If you allow that, you're responsible and you cannot shift the blame on another one. I pray God will make us courageous. Some people are no more courageous in their family. They are not courageous in the church. They are not courageous in the congregation. It's like you shift everything. Okay, marriage committee, marriage committee. No, it's not their responsibility. It is your responsibility. We're looking at Second Corinthians, Second Corinthians chapter six, and I'm reading from verse, uh, reading from verse fourteen. Second Corinthians chapter six. We're looking at uh, verse uh, fourteen. Here, the word of God makes it very clear. Clear, even in the New Testament that a believer will not be unequally yoked together with an unbeliever. It says in verse 14, being ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness and what communion as light with darkness it says what concord as Christ with Belial or what uh, what part as he that believeth with an infidel what agreement has the temple of God with idols for ye are the temple of the living God as God has said I will dwell in them I will walk in them I will be their God and it shall be my people wherefore tell me come out from among them all these people who are, they, they say they've seen the will of God somewhere and the person they are bringing they don't even understand salvation they cannot tell the root of the branch of salvation they cannot take the commencements of the consummation of salvation they don't have the conviction they don't have a testimony of salvation come out from among them and don't put your hand there don't put your voice there don't put your approval there and don't go along with them and say well that's what they want well, the word of God is saying, Come out from among them, and be ye separate, says the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. Only then will I receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and my daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Somebody said, Amen. Yeah. The Lord is telling us in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. I'm reading here from verse 8. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. We're reading from verse 8. It tells us in verse 8. It says, Neither let us commit fornication. Lying that let us commit fornication. Adultery is joining there. Immorality is joining there. Neither let us commit fornication. Any kind of the sin of the flesh. Neither let us commit fornication. As some of them commit meted and they fell in one day how many people three and twenty thousand the lord is warning us that immorality is still a sin is still iniquity and fornication is still a sin is still iniquity adultery is still a sin it is still iniquity in the sight of the lord you will not do it 
and church members will not do it if it happened in the past and now you are forgiven let that be the final thing it will never happen again in jesus name hebrews chapter 13 i'm reading from verse 4 hebrews chapter 13 verse 4 marriage is honorable in all and the bed on the fault but it says but all mongers and adulterers god will tell me God will judge. New Testament, adulterers, God will judge. Fornicators, God will judge. Immoral people, God will judge. Polygamists, God will judge. The people that go to live a careless life, God will judge. That's what the word of God says. We're looking at Psalm 50. We're looking at Psalm 50 and I'm reading from verse 16. Psalm 50. It says in verse 16, But unto the wicked God says, What hast thou to do to declare my statutes? The people that may have knowledge of the Bible, but their lives are not right. They have knowledge of the Bible, but they cannot really live according to the words they are preaching. There's no holiness in their lives. There's no righteousness in their lives. And God is saying to the wicked, He's saying to the backslider, He's saying to the sinner, He says, What hast thou to do? you to declare my statutes that thou shouldest take my covenant in thy mouth it says seeing thou hatest instruction and casteth my word behind thee when thou sawest a thief look at this thou consentest thou with him and has been partaker with tell me adulterers is not an adulterer but he is you know supporting adulterers is uh, backing adulterers is uh, encouraging adulterers is saying well if everybody forsakes him if everybody leaves him then who is uh, going to help him to come back and he's still preaching he's still saying i'm a minister he's saying what has thou to do to declare my word it says in verse in verse 19 thou givest thy mouth to evil and thy tongue framest deceit. Thou seatest and speakest against thy brother. Thou slanderest thine own mother's son. These things hast thou, have thou done. And I kept silence. And thou thoughtest that I was altogether such an one as thyself. But I will reprove thee. And search them in order before thy face. Look at verse 22. Now consider this ye that forget God, lest I cheer you in pieces, and there be none to deliver. You see, God is angry with that. He's angry with supporting adultery, supporting fornication, and supporting immorality, and just saying we're backing them up for this reason or for that reason. We're looking at uh, Proverbs chapter 6. Proverbs chapter 6. I'm reading here from verse 23. Proverbs chapter 6. We're reading from verse 23. For the commandment is a light, and the law is light, and reproofs of instruction at the ways of life to keep thee to keep the minister, to keep the child of God, to keep the safe soul, to keep thee from the evil woman, from the flattery of the tongue of a strange woman. Lost not after her beauty in thine heart, neither let them never take thee by the, by the eyelids. For by the means of an adulterous woman, a warish woman, that's what it means there, a man is brought to a lifeless piece of bread, and the adulteress were hung for the precious life can a man take fire in his bosom and his clothes not be burnt can one go upon hot coals and his feet not be burnt so he that goeth to his neighbor's wife Whosoever is Solomon, whosoever is Samson, whosoever a reader, a leader, whosoever touches her, tell me shall not be innocent look at verse 32 but whoso committeth adultery with a woman lacketh understanding he that doeth it destroyeth destroyeth what his own soul he wound and dishonor shall he get and 
thee and his reproach shall not be wiped away for jealousy is the rage of a man therefore he will not spare in the day of vengeance he will not regard any ransom any gift neither will he raise content though thou givest many gives the word of god is very clear and the word of god is warning us that we don't get into any evil we're looking at mark chapter 10 mark chapter 10 i'm reading from verse 2 mark chapter 10 verse 2 and the pharisees came to ask him and they asked him is it lawful for a man to put away his wife tempting him and he answered and said unto them what did moses command you and they said moses suffered us permitted us allowed us to write a bill of divorcement and to put her away jesus answered and said unto them for the hardness of your heart he wrote you this precept but from the beginning of the creation of god he made them male how many males and female how many females one man one wife for this cause shall a man singular leave his father singular and his mother singular and cleave to his wife singular the husband one the wife one and day twain not day three not day four there's no allowance for polygamy in the kingdom of god and day twain shall be one flesh it says so then there are no more twain but one flesh it says what therefore god has joined together let not man put asunder in the house his disciples asked him again of the same matter look at verse 11 and he says unto them look at this whosoever shall put away his wife and marry another what happens committed adultery and if a woman shall put away her husband and be married to another she she committeth adultery the word of god is very clear as you come to both the old testament and the new testament you see the perfect will of god and you see what god requires today and what we need to teach and what we need to emphasize and we're not going to support in any way well they are doing their marriage the fellow has gone out of the church and he has, is doing that marriage now but we know it is not of god we know it is so scriptural we're not going to say okay i'm not going as a member of the church i'm not going Going as a leader i'm just uh, going as a friend you're a friend and adulterer and you're supporting the adultery and you're supporting the evil and you're still saying that you belong to the lord it says what have you got to declare my name since you are like that i pray that we we'll repent in jesus name we're looking at romans chapter 7 in romans chapter 7 i'm reading from verse 2 it says for the woman which has an husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth but if the husband be dead she is loose from the law of her husband so then if while her husband liveth she be married to another man she shall be called tell me an adulteress but if her husband be dead she is free from that law so that she is no more an adulteress though she be married to another man the lord makes it very clear and the lord says we must repent if we're going to get to heaven and we must repent if we've been supporting people who are living a kind of promiscuous lives and careless lives and adulterous lives and then we're just saying well I, I'm, I'm for love i'm for fellowship and all that no you are not for love you are for disobedience against the word of god and i pray that as we repent and turn to the lord the lord himself will have mercy upon us and his good will be upon our lives in jesus name we're looking at revelation chapter 2 revelation chapter 2 and i'm reading here from verse 20 revelation chapter 2 and we're reading from verse 20 we see the standard of the word of god and what god commands today and what god says if you minister this is where we stand and this is where you must stand and you must not allow anything to sway you as if you are considering 
saying, should I go of them? Should I go of this one? The word of God is clear. Revelation chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 20. Revelation chapter 2 verse 20. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee. Because thou suppressed that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce, to teach and to entice, to teach and to defile my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed to idols. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. The only solution is repentance. And the only thing that will bring the favor of God is repentance. The only thing that will cancel that anger of God against the adulterers, against the fornicators, and against the perpetrators of evil and defilement in the body of Christ, the only thing that will give the solution and the favor of God again is repentance. It says, I give her space to repent. Look at verse uh, 23. And I will kill her children with death. And all the churches shall know that I am he which searcheth the race and the hearts. And I will give unto everyone. I will give unto how many people? Every one of you, according to your works. Revelation chapter 21. We're looking at verse 8. Revelation chapter 21, verse 8. But the fearful, you know, the preachers who are so fearful, they cannot declare the word of God. And the counselors who are so careful and fearful, they cannot declare the word of God. And people are looking up to us. They're looking up to the teacher. They're looking up to the preacher. And they're saying, he will tell me the truth. It's a deeper life pastor. It's a deeper life overseer. It's a deeper life teacher of the word. Obviously, he will tell me the truth. And now that deeper life teacher, overseer, pastor, is not able to tell the truth because I don't want them to say it's me that told him, it's me that told her the fearful and the unbelieving and the abominable and the murderers and the allmongers and the sorcerers and the idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone which is the second day. I will not go there. I said I will not go there. You know, if God has helped you and has set you free from your own sin and by the grace of God you are forgiven, you are cleansed and you are free. Don't allow the sin of another person. If they want to commit sin, you tell them the truth that this is the truth. Don't be so afraid of them that even though by yourself you don't have any personal sin to account for, but because of them, now you are going to spend eternity in hellfire, God forbid. I'm looking at the people. I said, God forbid, you will not perish. You'll keep yourself pure. You'll keep yourself clean. And you'll stand on the word of God without fear, without favor, in Jesus' name. Look at verse 27. And there shall he no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or, make, or maketh a lie, but they which are rich in, in the Lamb's book of life. Chapter 22, verse 14, verse 15. Chapter 22, verse 14. Blessed are they which do you is common means that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city but without are the dogs and the sorcerers and the all mongers those are the adulterers and the murderers and the idolaters and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie the lord is telling us the lord is warning us that the standard of the word of god remains the same today and we need to keep that standard point number three now the abiding power of divine assistance the abiding power of divine assistance for sanctified disciples the abiding power of divine assistance for sanctified disciples the lord can uphold us he will uphold us 
the Lord can keep us, he will keep us. We don't have to go to the foolishness of uh, Solomon. We don't have to go to the uh, filthiness of Solomon. We don't have to go to the promiscuous life of Solomon. We can live right. We can live holy. We can live sanctified life, holy lives, righteous life, all the days of our lives. Because there is the abiding power that keeps us. There's a, the abiding power that makes us stand. We're going to stand. I say we're going to stand. I'm talking about you there. Where are you? You will stand. Look at Hebrews chapter 1. I'm looking at verse 3. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3. Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person upholding all things by the word of his power. All things, all the planets he upholds, all the universe he upholds, and of course the believer, he upholds us as well. He upholds all things, all people, by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins and sat down at the right hand of majesty on high. He will help you. Isaiah chapter 41. Isaiah chapter 41, I'm reading here from verse 10. Isaiah chapter 41, and we're reading here from verse 10. It tells us in verse 10, Isaiah chapter 41, it says, Fear thou not, you will not fall. Fear thou not, you will not make shipwreck of your face. Fear thou not, you are not going to backslide. I said you are not going to backslide. What am I talking to there? You will not backslide. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen you. Yea, I will help you. And I will uphold you with the right hand of my righteousness. Look at verse 13. For I, the Lord thy God, will hold thy right hand. Saying unto thee, fear not. Fear not. Fear not. I will help thee, it will help you. Every moment, it will help you. When temptation comes, it will help you. And when confusion comes, it will help you. When you are at the crossroad, what do I do? Where do I go? The Lord will speak to you there because you are precious in His sight. Look at Isaiah chapter 49, and I'm reading here from verse 8. Isaiah chapter 49, we're reading from verse 8. It says, Thus says the Lord, in an acceptable time have I heard thee, and in the day of salvation have have I helped thee? Have I helped thee? Is he helping you? I will preserve thee and give thee for a covenant of the people to establish the earth and to cause to inherit the desolate heritages. And then he goes on to say that thou mayest say to the prisoner, he says he's setting you up as a deliverer as a liberator, as an emancipator. And he says, you will say to them, go forth to them that are in darkness, show yourselves, and they shall feed in the ways, and their pasture shall be in all the high places. They shall not hunger, nor thirst, neither shall the heat nor the sun smite them for he that has mercy on them shall lead them even by the springs of water shall he guide them the lord will guide you and the lord will guide your converts in jesus name how will this happen? How will this happen? That we who are preachers, that will stand. How will this happen? That we help the people we're teaching and the people we're counseling and the people we're leading, that they too will stand. The power comes and begins with, number one, a sure deliverance. A sure deliverance. The Lord has gone to Calvary. And the Lord has made the sacrifice. And because of that sacrifice, he gives us a sure deliverance. Total forgiveness and total freedom and total liberation. And he sets us free from sin. He tells us in Luke chapter 1, Luke chapter 1 verse 75, that he will grant unto us that we have been delivered he has delivered me I said he has delivered me he has delivered you it says that he will grant unto us that we've been delivered out of the hands of our enemies might serve him how 
without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our lives deliverance has come the sure deliverance so we're looking at galatians chapter 1 galatians chapter 1 and i'm reading here from verse 4 galatians chapter 1 and we're reading from verse 4 galatians chapter 1 verse 4 who gave himself for our sins that she might deliver us from the present evil world according to the will of god and uh, our father is sure deliverance not only that there is the sanctified disciple the sanctified disciple you're not just satisfied with i'm saved i'm saved no you need to go beyond that and then you go to calvary once again and you plunge in that blood of the lamp once again and you lay everything on the altar once again and you consecrate everything to the lord once again because there is sanctification for the disciple in ephesians chapter 5 from verse 25 husbands love your wives even as christ also loved the church and he gave himself for it that he might sanctify you see that that he might sanctify you see that that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word that he might present it to himself a glorious church this church will be glorious this church will be free from Adamic nature and this church will be free from all those things that pull people the propensities to evil when we're saved and when we're sanctified it takes all those propensities all the attractions to evil it gets everything away that he might present it to himself a glorious church not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing but that it should be holy and without blemish thank god it will happen thank god it has happened and then as we go to minister to our congregation it will happen to them you preach courageously and you preach firmly and you preach with conviction and that thing will pass on to them our churches will be righteous our churches will be holy our churches will be sanctified in jesus name hebrews chapter 2 hebrews chapter 2 and i'm reading here from verse 11 hebrews chapter 2 verse 11 for both he that sanctifieth is still doing it in the continuous days he still sanctifying people today he has not lost his power he has not lost his love he has not lost the pungency and the cleansing power of the blood of the lamb for he he that sanctified and they who are sanctified are all of one for which cause is not ashamed to call them brethren we are brethren to the lord and thank god his blood cleanses us from all sin but you know as uh, we have the sure deliverance and we have sanctified disciples those sanctified disciples they must have self denial self denial you see we cannot just live indulgent lives that's what was missing in the life of solomon there was no self denial whatever he saw he wanted it and he got it whatever he felt like i want to do that he just felt for it there was no self-denial but jesus said in matthew chapter 16 matthew chapter 16 i'm reading from verse 24 matthew chapter 16 reading from verse 24 it tells us uh, in verse 24 it says then said jesus unto his disciples if any man will come after me let him what does he do deny himself what does that mean your flesh wants something you say no you can't have that your eyes see something and desire and say no you cannot have that and your ear is hearing something as you go on the street and it wants to stay there you say no you cannot stay there you cannot keep on hearing that and your flesh or whatever it is might see other people doing something and then it's like your flesh is saying others are doing it can't help you say no you must say no to sell you must say no to your eyes you must say no to your mind you must say no to whatever it is on the inside there that is asking for that thing it says he said unto them if any man will follow me let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me look at luke chapter 9 luke chapter 9 i'm reading from verse 23 luke chapter 9 verse 23 
It tells us in verse 23, and he said unto them, If any man, any man, any man, you see, even if you are Paul the Apostle, you don't steal any man. If you are Samson, if you are Solomon, if you are Daniel, if you are Shednach, Meshach, or Abednego, if you are Abigail, if you are Ruth, or whoever you are, if anyone will follow, will come after me, let him deny himself. Deny himself. You cannot just go through life and take everything you want, touch everything everything you want look at everything you want open uh, you know internet and anytime you want and browse anything you want there must be self denial it says let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me the sure deliverance there is the sanctified disciple and thank god you are one and then there's self denial that you do know that's number four self discipline self discipline you know the people who are disciplined by the church that the people that fail to apply self-discipline if you have self-discipline that you already cancel church discipline you discipline your tongue you discipline your feet you discipline your hands you discipline your mind and you discipline your whole totality the totality of your being you are a disciplined man you are a disciplined woman a disciplined member of the church a disciplined minister in the church if you are already having self-discipline nobody is going to be running after you to discipline you we're looking at job chapter 36 job chapter 36 and i'm reading from verse 10 job chapter 36 verse 10 he openeth also their ear to discipline you see, as we read the word of God, that shows me I must discipline myself in that area. I must discipline myself in that area. I must discipline myself in that area. Verse 10, he openeth also their ear to discipline and commandeth that they return from iniquity. Pull back your eyes from looking at those things. Return. And pull back your mind from thinking about that thing. Return. And pull back your personality from associating with that thing. Return. In fact, he tells us personal self-discipline. Job chapter 31. Job chapter 31. Self-discipline. Self-discipline. Job chapter 31. I'm reading from verse 1. I made a covenant with mine eyes. Why then should I think upon a maid? That's self-discipline. That's self-discipline. And you make an agreement with yourself like that. Sacred decision sacred decision you see there are people they don't have anything that is sacred what would what we call secret this one is untouchable this one you cannot come beyond that point you draw a circle around yourself a circle around your life i'm a minister i'm an anointed man of god I'm a child of God. I'm called from on high. And I draw a circle around myself. And I say these are the decisions I'm taking. This is sacred. Nobody will turn this around. Nobody will touch this one. Nobody will fool around with this one. There is a sacred decision. I pray it will take effect in your life. Look at Daniel, Daniel chapter 1, Daniel chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 8. Daniel chapter 1, verse 8. Here is something Daniel said. He said, no matter where I go, Babylon, no matter where I go, Jerusalem, no matter where I go, anywhere I go in the world, this is sacred. And even Nebuchadnezzar cannot touch this. We're looking at Daniel chapter 1, verse 8. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defy himself or the portion of the king's meat nor with the wine which he drank therefore he requested of the priests of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself daniel said this is a no-go area i've taken this decision i've made up my mind that this is the way my life will go and not even the provision of nebuchadnezzar can change this a sacred decision look at your life do you have any sacred decision in your life something you have said this is who i am this is what i will do this is what i will not do this is what i will not touch this way i will not go that's what I will not look at. Whether anybody is there or not, this is my decision. 
and it's sacred. It's untouchable by any person. We're looking at judges. Judges, I'm reading chapter 11, verse 35. Judges, chapter 11, verse 35. And it came to pass when he saw her that he rent his clothes and said, Alas, my daughter, thou hast brought me very low. Thou art one of them that troubled me. For I have opened, I have opened, I have opened my mouth unto the Lord. Tell me the rest. I cannot go back. This is sacred. This is sacred. Whatever will go, will go. Whatever will get out of your life, or whatever, everything will have to go because this circle you have drawn, and you are standing at the center of that circle, and something comes and says, Hey, this is sacred. And no matter who this one affects, I've opened my mouth unto the Lord, and I cannot go back. You'll not go back in Jesus' name. Those are the people who are going to get to heaven. Look at Psalm 15. Psalm 15, I'm reading from verse 1. Psalm 15, and we're reading here from verse 1. Sacred decision. Sacred decision that you take and nothing can change it. There is the sure deliverance and there is the sanctified disciple and there is the self-denial. There is the self-discipline. There is a sacred decision. Lord, in verse 1, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Or who shall stand in thy holy hill? He that walketh uprightly and walketh righteousness and speaketh the truth in his heart. He that backbiteth not with his tongue, nor doeth evil to his neighbor, nor taketh up a reproach against his neighbor. In whose eyes a vile person is contemned. But he honoreth them that fear the Lord. He that, tell me everybody now. Allowed everybody, one, two, three, go. He that swears to his own heart and changes not. This one, I may lose business. He has sworn to his own heart, he will not change at all. He may lose friends, he may lose well wishers, he may lose anything. But he says, He that swears to his own heart and changes not. There is a sacred decision. There is sound devotion. Sound devotion. You make up your mind. You know that you are living by the word of God. And that thing is solid. That decision is solid. That devotion is solid. That dedication, dedication to righteousness, dedication to holiness is solid. And nobody can tamper with that in, a, in a Genesis chapter 39. Genesis chapter 39 in verse 7. And it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph. And she said, you know what she said, what she was looking for. And he, but he refused, but he refused, but he refused and said unto his master, so I behold, my master knows not what is with me in the house. And he, and he committed all that he had to my hand. There is none greater in this house than I, neither has he kept any, anything from me but thee, because thou art his wife. Now then, how then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? And it came to pass, as she spake to Joseph day by day, day by day, day by day, that he hearkened not unto her to lie by her or to be with her. And it came to pass about this time uh, that Joseph went into the house to do his own business. And, she, uh, and there was none of the men in the house there within. And she caught him by the garment and said, you know, she still wanted that evil thing. Uh, and he left his garment in her hand, tell me, and fled and what? And he got him out. That man had a solid devotion. I'm devoted to my God. I'm devoted to righteousness. I'm devoted to holiness. I'm devoted to this principle of life. I will not 
do this, cut off from that woman. If you have a real solid devotion and something is trying to pull you away from that devotion, say no, you will have to go. You will have to go because my devotion will remain. I pray that your decision will remain. And the end of this, number seven, the saints dominion. The saints dominion. Thank God you have dominion. I said you have dominion. And there is dominion, victory, triumph. Nothing will take away from you in Jesus' name. We're looking at, we're looking at uh, First John chapter 5. First John chapter 5. Uh, I'm reading from verse 4. First John chapter 5, verse 4. For whatsoever is born of God overcomes the world. That's dominion. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. Thank God I'm looking at people that have dominion. Are you one of them? I said, are you one of them? You have dominion. Nothing will take from you in Jesus' name. Chapter 4, chapter 4, verse 4. Ye are of God, little children, and then overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. You are victorious already. Chapter 5, chapter 5, verse 18, we know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not, but he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and that wicked one touches him not. Somebody there, the wicked one cannot touch. Somebody there, the wicked one will not touch. Receives the devil, he will flee from you. Stand up and come into victory, total victory. Complete victory, uncompromisable victory that you know that by the grace of God, that's a sure deliverance. By the grace of God, you are that sanctified disciple. By the grace of God, you are ready for self denial. By the grace of God, there's self discipline. By the grace of God, there's a sacred decision. And then there is a sound, solid devotion. And you have the saints' victory, and the saints' dominion, and the saints' triumph. Pray and tell the Lord, make sure in your life that this devotion and this authority and this dominion is firm and this is sacred. Nobody can take this away from you.